Welcome everyone to the uh, lung map update meeting. Um, we have 60 people online and I'm estimating in about a couple hundred in the room, right? That'd be it. No, but it's really great to see everyone. Uh, I'm Roy Herbst, um, currently the, the chair of the lung map though, as you just heard at the plenary session, um, at the end of this meeting, I'll be stepping down as a uh, special advisor emeritus, um, chair and Dr. Borgai and Dr. Redcamp um, will be the chair and vice chair. And then of course, very fortunate uh, for us, uh, Dr. Redman remains as, as the head of our uh, biostatistics uh, unit. And then here comes our lung committee chair, Dr. Jill Gray, who will come up to the podium. So um, we have about an hour and a half. Um, and we're going to really update on lung map and um, I'm very happy to see so many people here. So here's the agenda. Um, I'm gonna make a very short, I just gave a talk at the plenary, so I'm not gonna give it again. Uh, Mary will do up updates of manuscripts. Uh, we'll hear about a cruel uh, review and update on future directions. That'll be from Karen. Then um, we'll start hearing about the different uh, sub studies, 1900G by Sarah, uh, that we're actually going to do the training today. She's here. Then uh, lung map revision number seven of the screening. Uh, Josie, I hope, will be here. 1900F, Janelle, S1800D, John Rangel, S1900E, uh, Suki. If you came to the lecture earlier, you know the nomenclature, 1900 versus 1800. You'll have a little, have a little quiz. And then uh, we'll hear from Dave Kozner, who I know is remote. And then the Drug Selection Committee, uh, Haas and uh, Thema, who's going to be taking that over. So um, um, we'll start. Um, uh, I'll, uh, let's see what's happening. Right, we'll start with Dr. Janelle Gray, who's going to come to the podium and, and welcome us and make some announcements. Dr. Gray. You made my announcement. <laughs> All right, let me just check. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Um, I think Roy made my announcements for me. That's why he's such a great uh, vice chair of the Lung Committee. Um, but I did want to take a moment while we have you here and, you know, um, Roy just gave a phenomenal plenary session and um, let's give him a round of applause for that. You know, he really walked us through the 10 years of lung map and talked to us about where they started and this idea, right, and how they converted that into action and were able to build it to where it is today. And he has such commitment and dedication and perseverance to get this done. You know, I, I still remember when he and um, Mary and, and David and Valley were presenting this uh, at one of these SWAG meetings to the Lung Committee and how, and just seeing again, how it's built upward as well as outward. It's really about, um, it speaks, it's a testament to him basically about his ability to partner, his ability to, collaborate and really build energy and engagement across the public sector as well as the private sector. I really thank you all in the audience for your involvement and your support to get us to where we are, we are today. And um, we have decided that he is, while he's stepping down um, from lung chair, lung, lung map chair, he's not allowed, not allowed to leave us and he has unanimously been voted into a chair emeritus role and senior advisor on lung map. So congratulations again. So, and I also wanna thank him for all of his energy and his grace as we work through this transition. So we have our new chair, um, Dr. Haas Borgai from ECOG. And I think this speaks to, again, that partnership across all the intergroups, across Alliance, across ECOG, across SWOG, and across NRG. And it's so very important that we all continue this momentum to work together. Uh, and I'm gonna invite, I'm gonna take a pause here um, and also ask Dr. Borgai to, to come up and say some words on what his vision is. And then, um, Mary. Well, thank you, Dr. Gray. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arbs. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. Um, uh, again, I think this is the best example of, um, uh, you know, an easy transition between the leadership 
uh, after what uh, uh, Dr. Arps has uh, built along with other collaborators here um, as part of LongMap. Um, I've been an investigator on LongMap. I've been involved with this process uh, for a while. Um, I've been the chair of the uh, Drug Selection Committee uh, for the past few months. And I can tell you that uh, the cooperative and collaborative nature of this um, um, study and, and, and the organization that's come together uh, is simply amazing. The goal is to advance science. The goal is to come up with better treatment options for our patients who desperately need up better treatment options and having uh, collaboration and work uh, from across the country, every investigator um, uh, is actually very, very important uh, to all of us. And again, as an example, here I am, uh, an ECOC transplant at a SWOG meeting and taking over uh, in transition a, a major study just to tell you how important this is for all of us. So again, looking forward to the opportunity, looking forward to um, working with all of you even more and um, uh, hoping that we'll have many, many more positive studies, um, again, advancing the field. So thank you. Great, thank you, Haas. And, you know, lung map also would not be possible without having a very involved uh, vice chair. And I don't know if Dr. Jyoti Patel is uh, joining us uh, virtually. Yes. Um, so Dr. Patel has served as vice chair for LungMap for the past two years, and she's been critical in moving the umbrella pre-screening protocol forward and getting some more innovative ways, ways to get us to think more innovatively and more action oriented about how do we broaden the amount of patients that can go through that pre-screening um, pipeline. So I want to really congratulate her on all of the efforts in that area. And the amendment is coming. Laura, that. it's here. It's here. The ops team has worked really hard on this in partnership. One G is in the middle. Okay. And so we'll um, get that get that moving along. And um, uh, I wanted to allow. She's not great, Dr. Patel. Would you be able to grace us with some of your final thoughts? Uh, and she'll be she'll be fully leaving us also. Um, but transitioning from Dry Vice Chair and continuing on her role as one of the Lung Map Champions. So Dr. Patel. Great, thanks so much to all of you and really a huge congratulations to uh, the tremendous effort that this team has done for a decade. I mean, it really comes from um, Roy's leadership and now it's so fun to see some of these transitions. I know that, um, that Haas and Karen and Janelle will continue to, to grow what has been a real effort to represent patients around the country um, and to make sure that we're bringing innovative science to all patients and to make science accessible and to bring trials again to the community, to people who, who need access to these drugs. So um, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna give you an update about uh, amendment about our new screening criteria in a little bit, um, but, but it's really wonderful to be working with such a great uh, group of dedicated investigators as well as phenomenal leaders. So thank you. And thank you for your service. All right, and with that, I wanna, I'm excited to also announce our new vice chair who was also unanimously voted into the role, Dr. Karen Reckham, and she'll be serving as our new vice chair of LUNMA. And I'm gonna invite her up also to give us some words on her thoughts for our next, uh, our future. Thank you. Well, I don't know that there's a lot more to say. I'm happy to be a part of this team and this effort that is really moving in a great direction right now. And I look forward to seeing where we go with innovations and offering new treatments to patients. Um, I will be talking a little bit more a little bit later on. And so I'll leave the rest for later. But thank you, Roy. And thank you, Jyoti, for your leadership. So we also want to, um, you know, one of the things that um, makes Lung Map so unique is the partnership across various sectors, right? So you have a lot of medical oncologists up here who live for clinical research. We can't do what we do without our Lung Map ops team. So we're going to ask them to stand to be acknowledged. So if you can give Laura 
Jennifer and Chris, a round of applause, please. And the other part of this puzzle here is really the STAT Center. And this is a team that unwavers, that keeps us, uh, keeps everything in balance and is really led by a pillar of lung map by Dr. Mary Redman. And I'd like to um, invite Dr. Redman up and ask her to also introduce and so we can acknowledge her team as well. Sorry. <laughs> Well, well, I would like to share that we, we use shorthand to say the STATS team. It's the Statistical and Data Management Center that includes statisticians, data coordinators, applications development, people who study build, IT, you know, you name it. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens there. And so I don't know how many are in the room. I see Louise, who is like pillar of data coordinators. Um, anybody who's ever interacted with her knows that she... She probably knows lung cancer better than, than most people out there, um, which is very impressive. We also have um, at least one statistician, Mia C, who has just joined us, and she's also sitting right behind Louise. Um, Danny Weatherby is sitting next to her. She was, um, she was part of our uh, study build applications development team, and she's transitioned over to um, uh, Fred Hutch to be more data management, not data management, project management. And basically she just tells me what we can do and what we can't do. And I just listen to everything that she has to say. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else online. It could be that Shay Bellisti is online. She's another statistician that's worked um, incredibly hard um, with us. And I see at the back of the room, Chris Cook, who's at um, Cancer Research and Biostatistics. Um, he's actually now recently the chief technology officer at CRAB and he was in charge of building so much of what happened within uh, to build lung map. So um, thank you all for your efforts. And if I've forgotten anyone, please let me know or just you know know that you're appreciated. Thank you. It really does take a village, right? And and part of that village is our um, friends of cancer research. I don't know if Helen's on joining us virtually. Probably not. But okay. Um, but want to extend them. Uh, a very warm thanks for everything that they do. And, and really they are such a champion for the work that we accomplish and set out to do on a daily basis. So thank you to them. And I also wanna recognize our project management team, FNIH. Nothing would happen, none of these meetings um, would happen without their organization. So I see Jennifer Newsom in the back there and Atakwa, Atakwa in the room also. There she is. So thank you both. And I believe Stacy should be joining us online as well. Um, as well as, and we also have, you know, very strong teams across translational medicine also. So just really a great team effort. Um, and just wanted to acknowledge all those individuals. And with that, I will hand it back to Dr. Hurt. I forgot one person, Kevin Moralda, one, another data, set, um, data coordinator over there. So. All right, let's give everybody a one minute response. Let's start So um, this is very exciting. We have about 95 people online, by the way. So it's really a very engaged meeting. So I have, I was asked to talk about lung map accomplishments. Now um, I just gave um, a 20 minute talk, so I'm not going to do it again, but I was thinking about what to say here, you know, as my final meeting as the lung map chair. And you know, I'm at Yale and we have a pretty good cancer center, I think a really good cancer center, but an even better history department. So I was over at one of the residential colleges and I asked one of the history professors, you know, what should I say for a farewell? And he happens to be an American studies professor. So he said, you know, there was someone who served about eight years and was the first at something in the US and was a president and then he stepped down and he gave a farewell address. So something I haven't done in years is I actually read a book, not the science. And I, and I read a little bit about transitions. So I will leave you with three messages um, in my last four minutes. The first is um, be cognizant of what we've achieved. You know, we always, you know, we take care of cancer. It's never enough. You know, we all, many of us take care of patients here. Some of you are patients. Yeah, everyone must have someone who they know who's been a patient. We're making progress, but it's, it's slow, but it's steady. But we should be very, uh, all of us collectively, what we've done with one map, whether you're from industry or from NCI or from a foundation or an investigator or a patient, We've all really raised the bar on cancer. So never forget, we've, we've done a lot. We, of course, need to do, do more. 
The second thing this wise man said, probably written by Alexander Hamilton, was avoid foreign entanglements. And I will take that to mean, let's stay focused. We have to stay focused. We only have so much bandwidth. We have a look at the amazing team we have, operational statistics. We can't do everything. So I would say that in the next years, let's be focused on the best science, learn from our translational research, learn from our tissue, and really try to figure out what are the best new targets. I said it at the administrative meeting yesterday, and I'll say it again. We talk, we talk about personalized therapy, and I was there when that all was coined. It's now personalized, personalized therapy. It's not enough to use a targeted drug or to use an immunotherapy. Now we have to use it in even more precise ways. I think that's where we as lung map will do it. And the third thing, which is very important, is politics, right? So we have to, if we're gonna do this, we have to work as a team. I uh, wanna thank everyone. I think more than ever before, this lung map is functioning on all cylinders. The same meeting would occur at ECAD Akron, as NRG, uh, as Alliance. We're all working together. It's very important that the companies, the investigators, the FNIH has been our amazing uh, um, a broker to bring everything together, we continue to work forward. I know I'm really honored to be a chair emeritus, but I think even more important is to be a special advisor because I'm gonna stay involved and I look forward to working with everyone. These are my friends and colleagues. I, I value all of your work. So thank you very much. And let's get on with meeting. So one thing, uh, our publications, abstracts and presentations, um, and I'm gonna now pass it over to Mary. They all go through the D, S, and the C. So, uh, Mary. But, but I get to have a license to give you a little bit of a, a comment too before I start speaking, because um, I'm gonna talk about publications that we've done within LungMap on the primary clinical trials and other aspects. And what you won't see on this is that every single publication here, Roy is a co-author. And, and I think that Lung Map exemplifies team science and team science happens when you have leaders that make certain that team science happens where everybody has input from clinicians, statisticians, translational medicine scientists, in our protocol operations team, our data coordinators team, people who you know, are members of Foundation for NIH, everybody's given input and has provided some component to how we do our studies within lung math that's all contributing. And I would say in different ways, but equally important. And that happens when you have a leader that makes certain that that happens. And Roy, you help make that happen. So now that I've gotten a little sentimental here, let's talk about what we've accomplished. Um, the major publication that we had and you've heard about, uh, I think in a few venues so far at this meeting, um, and not to be discounted is, is the study um, S1800A, which was a randomized phase two study looking at pembrolizumab and remiserumab versus standard of care for patients who had previously received immunotherapy and platinum-based chemotherapy. Standard of care in the setting docetaxel or docetaxel remiserumab um, had been the standard of care for, for many, many years with um, little gains. And this study was both pre presented at ASCO and co-published in JCO. We analyzed the data in January or February of 2022, and we published it in June of 2022. And it's this amazing team that made it happen, and we're very proud about the work around that study. Oops, I think I jumped forward. Um, I also wanted to highlight that we have a couple studies where we've presented them at the results at ASCO. Um, the papers are, are, are coming along quite nicely. We have a study S1900A that's led by Jonathan Reese. And that looked at Lucaparib in patients with high genomic LOH and or BRCA1 and 2. Unfortunately, the study results, um, the study was not quote unquote positive. It answered a question though. And in fact, um, when the paper comes out and, and the, as he showed in his presentation to ASCO in 2021, we actually think that there's some interesting that, um, information to suggest that, that you need to actually have um, biallelic BRCA, not just um, just one, um, one allele to be able to suggest that you're gonna benefit and that that's why lung cancer differs from other types of cancers that benefit from PARP inhibitors. Then we had another study, S1900C, which was looking at the combination of Avelumab, so an anti pd one um, therapy combined with telozoprib, another PARP inhibitor, um, in patients with the STK11 um, a mutation, which those patients are known to not benefit from immunotherapy. 
Um, this study um, has some interesting data. It did not meet its endpoints, but I think that there's gonna be a lot that we learn from that. And we're looking forward to finalizing the publication and sharing it with the rest of you. And that was um, presented at ASCO this year. But I also wanted to take a look back at, at all of the studies that we've published over the years. So as you have seen throughout um, the, the day, uh, lung map initially started as S1400, and that 14 is because we initiated the trial in, in two, 2014. And, um, and we, we completed a whole series of studies and we've published all of them. We've not only published each of the sub-studies, I'll point out that S1400A, um, the lead uh, author on that was uh, Dr. Hospital Guy, our new lung map chair. Um, so, and you look at across these studies, S1400B, um, Marty Edelman was the primary uh, author on that publication. He's with Energy. The 1400C study with Corey Langer, he's also, is he also at Energy? And then Charles Agarwal and another group. So when you look down this list of first authors on that, on the last column there, you can see that we have representation from across all of the groups. So lung map from the start has always been a pan NCTN group study. And we're quite proud of that. And if you haven't read the first um, off, uh, paper on the list, you should. I mean, I'm a little biased, I wrote it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it does a really nice job of showing um, what lung map was in the first five years. And then I'll just finish at the end there, you have a publication where we did, um, we did a, a survey um, looking at both, asking both patients and physicians on their attitudes about genomic screening. So lung map has also, um, ventured into other aspects of treatment and, and how, how to deal with, with uh, doing studies in this patient population. And we hope to do more such um, analyses um, in the future. And then we also have a lot of translational medicine efforts going on here. And I know this slide is very, very busy. And I did that on purpose because you can see that um, at the World Conference on Lung Cancer in 2020, we had uh, three um, abstracts that were presented and the authors are, are finalizing those papers both looking at just next generation sequencing in um, squamous cell lung cancers and what we can provide based on the lung map screening protocol. We looked at the concordance between um, plasma ctDNA and tissue and national next gen sequencing. And Dr. Mack is sitting in the room here is working on that publication to show what the concordance is and how we could potentially use um, circulating tumor DNA in the future to, for patients to come onto lung map substudies. And then Dr. Dr. Hirsch led a publication looking at the combination of tumor mutation burden and PDL1 expression levels and, and outcomes with um, immunotherapy in two of our um, IO naive studies. And so a whole host of um, work that's ha happened there. And then we have collaborations with the CMAX where we they've presented um, at a number of meetings. And, and, we're, and so what I'm trying to show here is that this is truly team science. This is truly a collaborative effort and we span um, a whole host of aspects of treatment for lung cancer. And so um, I'll, I'll end there and, and actually pass the um, baton over to Karen to talk about this study that we're quite proud of. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a more of a sentimental meeting than I've ever been to for lung cancer. <laughs> Um, but also, I mean, really, I think with this 10 years, looking at the progress, it's really helpful to look back in order to try and look forward. So um, for the accrual, I just put in this, I just have this one slide that is showing um, our accrual review that we look at every week. And this is um, from September, um, not the most recent one, but it, it kind of gives you the, the, the picture. And it's a little too small to see or to highlight, but we have been looking at this chart um, for weeks now and understanding that in this post-pandemic world, um, we are not quite doing as well as we want to be doing with accrual for lung map. And we need to come up with solutions that are you know, 21st century solutions and post-pandemic solutions to try and increase that accrual. And so we're going to enlist all of you who are here to put the word out. Um, but I think that, I think there's multi-factors. Um, there was a period of time where we didn't have an unmatched arm and we had limited uh, arms or uh, un unmatched sub-study and had limited sub-studies for patients. And, um, and, and it looks to be that there are less um, sites that have actually opened some of the sub-studies. Um, and in the past, most of the sub-studies were opened by every site. 
many sites are struggling with staffing and um, putting uh, quotas and and um, and being a little more um, judicious in how they're putting trials through in all of their diseases. And so it's possible that not all the lung map studies are going through. So we're working on this and know that without this village and this dedication to opening these sub studies, we are not going to get the accrual we need and we are not going to move forward. So we are putting a number of things in place to increase the accrual and increase the awareness. Um, and um, I, I think we can talk about them a little bit more in detail once we've kind of put some of them through, but we are analyzing this data. We are talking to our sites. We are talking to our investigators and anything anybody in this room can do to put the word out and to get these sub studies open um, would be greatly appreciated. If there are issues with opening the study or putting patients on these studies, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us um, because we need to understand that and you know, put amendments through or um, work on it. One of the specific issues was the stability for the drug for S1800D, which should be um, rectified and clarified within the next uh, few weeks with the next amendment. So hopefully we will um, improve that for the unmatched substudy and, um, and try to get some of these uh, trials open at more sites and get a better accrual. Are there any comments by the audience or the online? Anyone who um, enrolls for the trial, either online or in the audience, want to comment on their experience? They want to keep this interactive. Mary, anyone there on the line that we can call on? Not that I can see. And is it, does anyone anybody want to talk about not enrolling or not opening the trials? Is there a reason why if you don't have it open at your site? Someone's put a patient on in the last month. Who went, oh yeah, in the back row there. Oh, you're just scratching your head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So many, well, talk right into the microphone. Sorry, I, I, we recently enrolled many patients in the screening protocol. However, the, their biopsy is coming back with not sufficient tissue. I know you mentioned something about liquid biopsy. I think it's a big hard stop for us because probably around, I would say 40% of our patients are not able to run again through foundation one. And most of them already had foundation one as their standard of care. So we are working on newer ways for patients to get into the sub-studies. And so that will be part of it. And um, you'll hear from Dr. Patel a little bit later on the amendment that's coming through. And some of the match sub-studies are going to include novel ways of getting a patient onto these studies. So stay tuned for that, but that is the, in the works for the next steps. But we do allow patients to use uh, previously completed Foundation One to get onto lung map. So that was initiated in May of 2021. And so all you have to do is, is it's, it's part of the screening protocol and you can submit um, a request to use the previously completed um, Foundation One. Um, so there's a way to screen uh, to put that in and then Foundation communicates the results directly to us and so if you are using foundation as your screening tool, you, those patients can go directly on the lung map without having to supply tissue. So again, if you can um, get us any information that may help us uh, understand the accrual issues and anything that might help lung map uh, move forward and improve its accrual, that would be helpful. Oh. Mary. Yeah, I can see them. I was, uh, I'm looking at them. So, so there are some questions here. One of the questions is, I just want, I need to go back up. So somebody states that part of the issue with decreased is with decreased staffing that putting a patient along that in a sub-study, it's a lot of duplicate data having to be entered. I'd be curious to hear more about what the duplicate data is, because of course we don't want to have that, but I'll, I'll, point out that, um, but then there's an also a uh, comment, a question about um, being able to use something like Tempest or, or Karis. And, um, and the answer is, is that we're working on, on being able to allow such things. Um, it's not a trivial thing to accomplish, but we, we have the best intention to work towards. 
towards that. But you know, the, um, if the person who put the comment about the duplicative efforts, if you could send a email or something to any one of us, um, we can look into that further because we really don't want there to be, we want this to be a, a, a trial that is straightforward and easy to do. I know there, there are steps to put in the tissue and all of that, but um, we wanna make sure that it's as easy as possible. So we've heard a lot about S1800A, um, and so I will be talking a little bit more. And Roy has given us a very good view of what has happened over the last 10 years. And I think I have a better understanding now of really the deep developments of these partnerships that have been created, which have really paved the way for where Lung Map is today and where it could be going. And so using S1800A, I'm going to give just a little flavor of where we might be going. And um, again, we've seen this many times, um, S1800A, um, again, pretty straightforward trial, um, ramesurumab and pembrolizumab versus standard of care. We did supply ramesurumab in both arms, um, the standard of care and the uh, uh, investigational arm. And so the majority of patients actually received docetaxel ramesurumab, which I think helped us to see this result as even more powerful as most patients received kind of the best standard of care out there. And so as you see, hazard ratio was 0.69 with a p-value of 0 0.05 and the median overall survival for ramesurumab uh, pembrolizumab was 14.5 months. When we looked at subgroups, um, we had benefit across all subgroups. The two that pulled out the most were squamous cell and then patients who received chemotherapy followed by iotherapy. Um, but this, you have to understand, our patients who progressed on prior first-line therapy, they were getting screened in S1400 as squamous cell. And that's a good proportion of the first group of patients. And for some of this, the squamous cell patients didn't have immunotherapy options in the frontline setting because um, it was in the middle of S1800A when um, we got the um, platinum uh, paclitaxel uh, pembrolizumab combination for uh, squamous cell. And so time keeps changing and uh, it alters the patients that we're entering in these trials. But again, those are the two that pulled out the most. And importantly, the toxicities we saw were not surprising. They were in line with what we see with chemotherapy and immunotherapy and, uh, and, and VEGF receptor antibody therapy. We did see a little more vascular um, toxicity in the patients who received ramesurumab and pembrolizumab. In another ana analysis, it was similar in patients who received any ramesurumab, so on the standard of care. Um, but we know what these toxicities are, and I think that's the important piece. And there were no real surprises. Um, and the, the, the chemotherapy arm had more um, grade three, four toxicities. So moving on, we want to, we want to study this in a phase three trial. Um, as Roy said, we put this into breakthrough uh, designation uh, consideration and, uh, and uh, wanted to be evaluated by NCCN, but it's really still a phase two trial. And we'd like to confirm this in a phase three trial. Um, lung map, the, the, the pieces that lung map has put into place and the partnerships with the companies um, that uh, we worked with and FNIH and, uh, and uh, Friends of Cancer Research, this all helped to stimulate, and even the FDA and NCI and, and CTEP, so this all stimulated interest in how do we validate this, this question that we put into motion many, many years ago. So this was, we probably, was probably around 2016 or so when uh, that first frontline trial was, or that phase one trial was done to show the safety of the combination. And so the wheels have been in motion for a long period of time. How do we just take this across the finish line? And so there's a lot of interest across multiple groups. And again, this village that is working together continues to work together. And so we still do need effective therapy for patients who are immuno checkpoint uh, inhibitor refractory. And um, we have limited options um, that are approved. And so we are putting forward a pragmatic clinical trial to promote diversity and inclusion in clinical trials, to reduce barriers, and to, as um, the comment that was made earlier, to help in sites have a reduction in the burden of data collection, and to empower our investigators to treat patients how they really would treat a patient. Many of these uh, randomized trials in the second line or the next line setting, um, there are many patients who fall off because they're randomized to the docetaxel arm. 
And um, so this is a trial that we want to really empower people to treat patients how they would normally treat their patients. Um, so S2302 is um, a trial that is in development. And uh, right now, this is the schema of the trial and it is um, arm A is standard of care. And the standard of care is recommending that people look at the NCCN guidelines for subsequent therapy post immunotherapy. Um, but there are, no, um, there are no specifics that are uh, required for the standard of care. And for arm B, it's remesirumab pembrolizumab and um, certified by performance status. And as note, we are including uh, performance status two and the most recent um, prior therapy, whether it includes immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, again, this is collaboration across the groups. Um, we have my, myself as the chair, Dr. Dragnev um, from Alliance as the co-chair and Dr. Imes from uh, NRG as the, you know, from ECOG, from the um, ECOG as the, another co-chair, Mary Redman uh, as our infallible uh, statistician with Jailing Mao. And then we have a community engagement representative, uh, Daniel Terzosa. And uh, our objectives really, it's simple to look at the overall survival. I think Roy presented this earlier. And our secondary objectives are really to look at the high, high grade toxicities. So we don't want um, to be putting in data about low grade toxicities. It's just the high grade toxicities for this um, investigational arm. Um, and the, el the eligibility criteria, this is not for you to read um, specifically, but it is to show you that this is the eligibility criteria. This is it. Um, and so that's the important thing. Um, we paint, we, you know, we started with S1800A as the template and basically deleted. Um, and so we have a streamlined protocol with as limited per, uh, 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 eligibility as possible. These are drugs that are through the FDA with known toxicities with package inserts. So we do want people to look at the package insert and treat as they would, but we want people to treat as they would in their own institutions and their own practices. Specifically, this is for patients who have stage four recurrent non-small cell lung cancer. They have to have received at least one line of um, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy and a line of platinum-based chemotherapy. This could be a patient who received it in the new adjuvant setting or the adjuvant setting or the consolidation setting after uh, chemo radiation. And importantly, they'll have to progress um, in less than 365 days to be included. Otherwise, they'll have to receive it for metastatic disease as frontline therapy. Patients have to have a response or they have to have at least stable disease as their um, best response to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy for at least 84 days. So they can't have immediate progression. So this is acquired resistance specifically. And so outside of that, it really, um, those, are the, those are the eligible uh, patients that will be on, put on this trial. And again, how you would treat your patients in practice. Statistical con considerations are here. And again, the 700 patients, we have a little higher, um, a little lower threshold or higher threshold um, with a power of 85% to detect a hazard ratio of 0.77. So that's a novel aspect of this trial, knowing that we're going to have patients that are more real world and not as selected as in uh, S1800A. Um, and again, we'll be doing a primary analysis. We have two interim analyses and um, hope that this will be a trial that can get through a lot of the barriers, bring a new paradigm of simple trials to answer a simple question that will allow for patients um, across the US at this point in time to enter easily and for sites to uh, treat patients how they normally would and get an answer to a question in a simple and uh, more straightforward manner than many of our trials have been done um, more recently. Any questions? What do people think in the audience uh, uh, or on the phone? Do you, uh, people excited to do this trial? It, it, yeah. let's, let's see who's gonna open the trial. Online, raise your hands online. Mary's watching. <laughs> No, seriously, this, this is, um, if you're at a cancer center, you know, you want to offer trials to your patients. Trials are hard. This, this will be a therapeutic trial accrual. It's a good, uh, good equipoise. It's a, it's, a, it's a good combo. If you're in a more of a community setting, you know, you're looking for something to do in the refractory setting, 
What do you do in refractory patients, uh, Haas, when they have failed IO? I put them on long map. <laughs> what I wanted him to say was, all we have is docetaxel. What is that, Jeff? That's not good enough. So um, we're hoping this will accrue really quickly. And um, we have an audience question. Oh, here we go. Is Pembro provided as part of the study? So pembrolizumab is not provided on this study. Or no, it, sorry, no, 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 sorry. Pembrolizumab is provided on this study um, in the in the investigational arm. So for the investigational arm, both ramucirumab and pembrolizumab are um, provided. With uh, we don't provide ramucirumab for the standard of care arm because we're not specific, specifying what patients need to have for the standard of care arm. But all of the investigational agents are provided. Is anyone here from Merck? We, there was someone this morning. Or anyone from Lilly? I, I want to thank you. That's why I raised your hand. Thank you. So, you know, we, we uh, you know, the support for these studies is not only the, the conduct of the study, the, the monies we're going to use to make people know about the study, but the drug has to go to the NCI and it's got to be shipped out and brought back. There's a lot of, and plus we get it for free, right? Which is the effort. So we thank the companies for their support of this important trial. And this couldn't have been done without the runway of one map that has made this possible. So, thank you. So now, Sarah, um, my colleague, friend uh, from Yale, Dr. Goldberg, who now runs the Division of Thoracic Oncology at Yale, well, she's recently promoted, and she is um, going to tell us about S1900G, and you're actually gonna train us a little bit, right? Mr. Question Do you do a little training right now? Oh, yes, we're going to do some training. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it's uh, great to be here. This is, um, well, I know many of the lung map leaders over the last several years and was part of SWAG when it started. I haven't actually been officially part of lung map until now. So it's really wonderful to have developed this concept and protocol with the whole lung map team. It's really, as you've heard several times, and you all probably know, it's an incredible team and, and really just so much fun to work with everyone to develop this. So I'm gonna to talk to you about this, um, this sub-study. I'm gonna share Roy's uh, computer here. <laughs> That's for me. Okay. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna talk for a couple of minutes because, because this is uh, uh, basically the kickoff for this trial. Um, we're, we're anticipating activation in the first quarter of 2023. Um, which is just in the next couple of months. It's a technical difficulty. It's okay. It's just a big box in the middle of the slide that I can't see. It's fine. Um, okay, so this is a, a randomized phase two study of catmatinib plus osimertinib with or without ramucirumab in participants with EGFR and MET amplified metastatic or recurrent non small cell lung cancer. So this is S1900G. And there's a couple of really key differences with this sub-study as opposed to many or most of the other lung maps and sub-studies, and I'll, I'll highlight those as we go along. It's okay. Uh, okay, so here's the schema first, and we'll refer back to the details, of course, throughout the, the slides, but just wanted to give first an overview of, um, it's very technologically savvy as well. Uh, so, so this is the schema. So on the left, you can see the key eligibility for this trial. So I'm good. You can't see it. What do you mean? I know, but it's just like you can't see it. Okay. Try to not break Mary's computer. Put an extra oh, thank minute you. on the game clock, please. Okay, I think we're good. All right, we're great. Thank you, Mary. That's great. Okay, so um, here's the schema. So um, eligibility on the left. So again, this is uh, a trial specifically for patients with advanced EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. So already this is a, a difference from many of the other, or really all of the other lung map sub sub-studies. It's for patients who have a known EGFR mutation. Um, and then this is also for patients who have MET amplification. And it's not just MET amplification at diagnosis, but it's as... Um, a med amplification that develops at the time of resistance to EGFR therapies, specifically uh, uh, upon progression on osimertinib. Patients have to have at least one prior EGFR inhibitor, including osimertinib as the most recent treatment uh, prior to going on study. They can have had chemo with or without immune therapy, but it's not required. Again, another key difference here. 
um, in this study. They can't have had prior MET or VEGF pathway inhibitor therapy, and they are allowed to have um, asymptomatic brain metastases. So the randomization is done in a one-to-one -one fashion to the combination of capmatinib with osimertinib and ramisteramab or capmatinib and osimertinib alone. And the primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Our goal is 60 eligible patients, and we're planning on um, enrolling uh, 66 for that uh, goal. And we're stratifying based on brain metastases and whether patients have, are, are getting second line therapy or third line and beyond. And one point I'll make here, because I don't really touch on it in the rest of the, of the slides, there will be a safety run-in because the, the combinations actually in both arms um, haven't been formally studied. Um, and so we will be uh, looking at the first 10 participants in each arm. And if the regimens appear too toxic, the dose of catmatinib will be reduced. So here's some background um, and, and uh, really the rationale for this, uh, for this trial and the combination of drugs. So uh, part uh, patients with advanced EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer typically respond very well to EGFR inhibitors. And our standard EGFR therapy in the clinic is, is osimertinib. However, nearly uh, universally patients uh, develop resistance and, and disease progression. Um, sometimes after a few months, sometimes after a few years, but universally patients will progress on EGFR inhibitor therapy. And so there's now been um, a, a lot that we know about what happens at the time of resistance to EGFR therapies, particularly to first-line osmertinib, again, that now being our standard. And you can see that in the figure there. This is a pie chart showing all the different mechanisms of resistance uh, when patients are treated with osmertinib. I don't know if you can see the details, but in the yellow piece of the pie in the top right, that's met amplification. And so about up to maybe 15 or 20% of patients that are progressing on osimertinib um, will develop met amplification as the mechanism of resistance. And there's been several studies over the last few years looking at combining an EGFR inhibitor with a met inhibitor in these patients who have EGFR mutant lung cancer and develop met amplification. And there does seem to be some benefit there. The problem is that the response rates are lower than we, we would like to see and the durability is also not long of, of that response. And so there's been now uh, also many studies looking at inhibiting the VEGF pathway in patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer. We know that when you add a VEGF or a VEGF R2 inhibitor to um, an EGFR therapy, you can improve progression-free survival. Um, I'm gonna be talking about a study like this uh, in, in the lung committee meeting later today. Um, but what we're looking at is not just combining an EGFR inhibitor with a VEGF inhibitor, it's also adding the MET component into that. And so there's now, uh, really, I think, impressive preclinical data that demonstrates the important crosstalk between VEGF and MET signaling. And so that really provides a lot of the rationale for this combination where um, the dual inhibition of VEGF R and MET may be able to delay or even overcome resistance to EGFR inhibitor therapy. So the primary objective for this study is to compare the investigator-assessed progression-free survival between participants with EGFR mutated, MET amplified non-small cell lung cancer who were randomized to catmatinib, osimertinib, with or without ramisiramab. There are several secondary objectives. Um, one is to look at toxicity um, uh, during the first cycle. Specifically, we're, we're looking at, um, uh, at that because, again, it hasn't been uh, formally assessed in a trial. We're going to look at the frequency and severity of toxicities with, within each of the arms. And then we're going to look at the uh, progression-free survival in multiple different subsets. So we're gonna get a lot into the tissue components of the study because it's, it's a bit complicated. I wanna make sure people are very clear on this, but we're going to look at, at different subsets of patients based on how MET amplification was detected. So we're going to be looking at MET amplification, patients with MET amplification detected in tissue, those who have it detected in circulating tumor DNA. We're also going to look at patients with or without brain metastases and patients who have different number of lines of prior therapy. Additionally, we're looking at response rate, dur duration of response, and overall survival. Um, as you've seen already in, in many of these studies, the translational medicine is such an important component. We'll be looking at circulating tumor DNA, and then also participants will be asked to contribute tissue and blood to a repository. So here's an overview of the treatments that I've already mentioned on the study. You probably all know osimertinib. Again, this is a, our standard first line uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor that we use uh, for patients with EGFR mutations in the clinic. Um, capmatinib is also a kinase inhibitor that specifically targets MET. 
it's approved for, patient, for people with met exon 14 skipping mutations. So this is a different biomarker. The, the biomarker on this study is met amplification, but catmatinib is an FDA approved drug for, for different uh, met altered patients. And then Ramos, you might be already heard about this uh, in this session today. Ramos is a VEGF R2 antagonist that results in inhibition of angiogenesis. And again, this is an approved drug either in combination with erlotinib based on the, the data from a, a EGFR um, uh, ramacirumab trial or with docetaxel. So um, I think this is very, uh, the, the things that I'm showing here are, many of the things I'll show you here are very common in lung map studies. No concomitant systemic therapies are permitted while on trial. We do allow radiation for symptomatic metastases such as bone metastases while on study. There are several pre-medications that are recommended, although there are none that are, um, that are required, and you can see them listed here. Um, uh, several for supportive care, antidiarrheals, um, diuretics, et cetera, are allowed to be given if, as per the guidelines by ASCO, and pre-medication with a uh, histamine antagonist is recommended before ramacirumab, but not required. Here's a summary of how the, the treatments are administered. Osimertinib and catmatinib are both oral drugs. Osimertinib is a once a day drug at 80 milligrams. Catmatinib is 400 milligrams twice a day. Um, Ramacirumab is an intravenous drug. It's given at a standard dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram on days one and 15, and these are all in 28 day cycles. Um, and then our, our plan is to assess disease using CT scans with or without brain MRIs every eight weeks. And you can see a list of prohibited medications there. This is also part of the exclusion criteria. I won't, I won't go through the details. I do want to talk about the key eligibility because, again, this really does differ from, from several of the lung map um, uh, sub-studies. So patients are required to have an EGFR mutation, uh, a sensitizing EGFR mutation, and are required to have progressed, at, in the opinion of the treating physician, on osimertinib. Um, so already, again, this is a different, uh, different subset of patients. So patients already have an EGFR mutation from baseline and have already gotten a targeted therapy. So again, a different, um, kind of a different mindset for lung map here, where we have patients who already received a targeted therapy and are now progressing. And so we, we tried to be generous with our requirements for prior um, treatments. So patients could have had osimertinib as their only prior, or they could have had multiple lines of therapy. And the main requirement here is that osimertinib is the most recent prior therapy, but it can be in combination with other treatments. So I know um, in, in clinic, many patients will receive osimertinib first line, and then they'll get chemotherapy, maybe with continuation of osimertinib, and then they would be eligible uh, to go on the study in either one of those scenarios. And then of course, we are looking for MET amplification. This is really the biomarker in question um, as part of lung map. We're looking for patients not only who have EGFR mutations, but at the time of progression on osimertinib have developed MET amplification. And so again, we tried to be generous here in terms of uh, how we're defining MET amplification and what tissue and, and or what, how we're looking for it. Um, we allow tissue or blood-based testing for MET amplification. So this goes to some of the questions that were being asked about um, how we can get patients on study. So we do allow either one, blood or tissue. Um, if, uh, if patients don't have MET amplification assessed or detected at the time that they're enrolling on lung map, let's say they just have an EGFR mutation and they're progressing on osimertinib, they can go on the lung map screening protocol to have their tissue or blood, well, tissue on lung map screening protocol, tested for MET amplification. Um, if they've already had that done as part of standard of care, because I know that's many people's practice is to test blood and or tissue at the time of progression of osimertinib, that can be used as well, as long as it's being done in a laboratory with uh, CLIA or other uh, certifications. So I'm gonna go into that again in one more slide because it's such a key point here, but I'll just move on with the other eligibility. So patients can have either measurable or non-measurable disease. They can have um, uh, asymptomatic CNS metastases, but symptomatic CNS metastases are, is not, are not allowed. They can have had a prior anti-VEGF or VEGFR inhibitor or a prior MET inhibitor. Performance status must be zero or one. An EKG is required and uh, there's a QTCF cutoff of less than or equal to 470 milliseconds. There's a requirement to look for um, protein or proteinuria because of the use of, of uh, ramacirumab. And then cardiac function is important. Again, some of the drugs can uh, impact cardiac function, and so that's a, a critical uh, part here as well. And then we list uh, uh, some of the drugs that are not allowed because of the um, uh, um, conflicts with the other drugs on the study. 
So when we look at um, anticipated adverse events, these are all three of them are approved, FDA approved drugs. They haven't, again, been looked at in combination, but they're all individually FDA approved. And so we don't anticipate any toxicity outside of what is typically expected for these drugs, although we will be watching. I'm not gonna go into detail here. This is of course all in the protocol and is, is fairly standard. I'll just say a couple of points about dose modifications and interruptions. So dose reductions for ramucirumab are only allowed for proteinuria. Other significant toxicities may require just discontinuation of ramucirumab. Osimertinib and catmatinib can be dose reduced as needed. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention is this uh, last point, which is if osimertinib or catmatinib must be discontinued, the participant must be removed from therapy. If ramucirumab is discontinued, people can stay on the study as long as they're tolerating it. I'm including a dose modification table. Again, I won't go into detail here. There are dose modifications allowed for osimertinib and catmatinib. Again, ramucirumab only for proteinuria. Criteria for removal from treatment. This is here for reference. Again, I'm not going into detail. It's, it's fairly uh, standard in, in the lung map trials. Um, and then in terms of registration for the study, this is, uh, again, a complicated part because it's different than other studies. So this is um, the screening step for lung map registration. It occurs prior to substudy assignment to S1900G. There's three possible ways to get on this substudy, if I have. Uh, <laughs> trying to sneak out. Um, so there's three possible ways, right? This is how I think about it. We're gonna have to come up with some pretty uh, graphic for this because again, I know it's confusing. One is that participants with EGFR mutant lung cancer progressing on osimertinib, um, but they haven't had repeat molecular testing at progression yet. They could submit a new biopsy material for study for biomarker profiling on lung map, right? So that's, that's kind of the standard way that many patients go into lung map in general. Again, the key difference here is that patients are already on EGFR therapy and progressing. And if met and amplification is detected, they'll be assigned to S1900G. The other ways are, are more unique. One is that if patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer progressing on osimertinib had repeat testing at the time of progression using foundation one, that, that report can be submitted. So this is what Mary was, was um, mentioning before that patients can go on lung map with foundation one testing. Again, the difference here is it's at the time of progression. And then the third way, which is the more complicated way, it gets its own slide, is that if, if, if you've done local testing for MET amplification at the time of progression on osimertinib, that can be used. The tissue testing, it can be done, it can be, uh, done using any CLIA test. So people mention Tempest, Neogenomics, whatever it is, whatever in-house assay, as long as it's CLIA or other uh, lab certified, yeah, that can be used if it detects MET amplification. For blood-based testing, if that's what you're using to look for med amplification, it's only with foundation medicine or garden, which I think are probably the most commonly used assays. Um, so again, we're trying to be really broad here and capture these patients with med amplification. It's not the most common alteration and we're trying to catch them however, however we can. Um, and, and you have, see the email address there, our phone number. We're always happy to answer questions about this. And one other thing I don't have on the slides is the level of med amplification. So for a long time, we discussed and debated what the appropriate level was that we should allow patients to go on. And then it turns out that these assays really call people positive or negative, amplified or not amplified. And so it's basically whatever the assay uses to call people met amplified, that's what we're using. And that's why we're doing the central confirmation um, to do a sub-analysis, a subset analysis later on. Um, okay, so there's registration for S1900G. Um, there's protocol specific requirements. This are in section 13.2 of lung map. There is an optional training material. It's not required. And then data submission um, is uh, according to the protocol requirements for all participants registered whether or not they receive treatment. And there's more details in section 14 of the protocol. Specimen submission is, I think, fairly standard for lung map. We're again looking at CT DNA assay at multiple time points, day one, cycle one, day one, cycle one, day fifteen, cycle three, day one, and at progression. And additionally, there's um, uh, Buffy code and plasma banking if patients consent. There's routine data monitoring for this study. You can all tell me if I need to go into details here, but otherwise, I'm going to skip ahead because I think it's uh, fairly standard. And same for quality control, there's uh, on-site monitoring, again, standard for lung map. 
Um, we, we've been so lucky to work with um, Novartis and Lilly on this study, and they've just been amazing. Katmatinib and Ramacirumab will be provided. Osimertinib is co commercially available and should be purchased by a third party for patients. We are working on ways to advertise the study and to explain it, because again, it's a bit different than other lung map sub-studies. Um, and so there, there will be plain language trial summaries and uh, social media toolkits. And we would appreciate input on if these things are, are helpful and straightforward and if you have other ideas. Please contact us with questions. If, you, if anything here was unclear as the study opens, if you have patients you're considering, I'm always happy to, to talk about it. Really appreciate your attention. Thank you. Do we have any questions uh, uh, for Sarah? Everyone feel trained on the phone? Okay. Oh, yes, I'm the chat now, too. Yeah, I, that was my job, but I've lost it. Sorry. Um, I can't tell how old these chat comments are. No, those are old ones. These are old. Okay. Okay, good then. Well, Sarah will be in the second row from the back, and you, you can grab her with any questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, Dr. Patel, we're here in your own city, and you can't even come over here in person. Right. Sorry so much. At least the weather's perfect for you. Are you breaking my heart? Okay. Well, I, I just want to say, did you see the talk? I showed you a picture. Uh, it's been great working with you as the vice chair, and. Uh, you've done so much, and this has been a labor of love, this uh, revision number seven. So Dr. Patel is, 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 is right down there in, in, the, in, the million, in the million dollar mile down there, you know, but um, Jyothi, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much. And again, sorry to miss you. I had some institutional commitments today. So sometimes it's even worse when you're in your hometown for these meetings. Um, but thanks so much. And, um, you know, Sarah, I think you set me up so well for this because there's a lot to talk about this revision. And really this comes at a time after um, you know, 10 years of progress. A lot has happened in these years. And so it was time to update the screening protocol. So next slide, please. So oh, maybe I'm sharing, my, I can share my screen. Would that be better? Yes, if you have slides, why don't you want to go ahead and share your screen? Okay. How's that? So, so this is a high level schema um, that really, um, I think, capitulates everything that we've been doing. So, if you traditionally, patients would come onto Lung Map. Um, biomarker testing would be um, done. And now the past year and a half, past year um, under, you know, the, we've been able to now use submission of previously completed biomarker screening. This was really a huge effort and, you know, kudos to Joel Neal and the entire biostatistical um, support team and really led by Mary as well, that we could start importing data from commercially done foundation medicine into our database. That is a huge undertaking to think about all of um, the variables that need to be um, imported in a way that we can use them for future testing. But patients would have either biomarker testing done before or um, while they were on treatment, patients were either pre-screened prior to progression, that used to be the vast majority of patients, when they had progression, then they were assigned to a sub-study. Whereas now we're seeing a fair number of patients who are screened at the time of progression. So after initial frontline therapy, patients have progression and then they go on to study. Um, before, sort of in this big purple box, if um, they had successful biomarker um, profiling, the sub-study registration would happen and Luckily and insightfully, when the um, study was first designed, patients who had progression may be potentially eligible for another sub-study and the, and the cycle would continue. Now, if we think about really what has changed is this much more detailed schema. And this really is 
um, has been put in place because we've developed um, studies that address patients with uh, known targetable mutations. So there's so two things that you'll hear about. The first study that you heard about is S1800G from Dr. Goldberg, and then you'll hear about the RET study um, from Dr. Gray in just a bit. But if we look at all patients that are uh, deemed eligible, patients are consented, and then we know that either tissue is submitted for foundation testing or we have known commercial results, patients are registered, and then again, patients are pre-screened or screened at progression. Um, what has really changed are these two arms, these EGFR patients with progression on osimertinib, as Dr. Goldberg pointed out, um, patients with known MET amplification can be found by a number of mechanisms. So on um, any platform that includes blood or tissue, as well as foundation medicine, either commercial or submitted at the time of progression. Um, and then we'll address the RET patients in just a minute. But clearly it's a little bit more complicated, but again, with this idea that there is flexibility of either um, the, the assay as part of study, a commercially um, approved uh, or commercial foundation medicine in which the data transfer happens, and that usually happens between two and three weeks, as well as these small biomarker defined populations. Um, so again, sort of for the sub studies in which, um, in which patients have had um, the archival or previously completed genomic testing, you can do it during pre-screening or on therapy. The real issue here is, in, and the distinction is looking at sub-studies that evaluate mechanisms of resistance prior to a targeted therapy. So that intuitively makes sense, the EGFR population, for example, and hopefully we built this in for subsequent studies down the road. Um, so again, the screening, the vast majority of patients still get foundation medicine as part of study, but you can use commercial CDX, and it takes a little bit of lag time to get that data imported, but it happens in less than a month. For patients who developed resistance on targeted therapy, so you heard from Dr. Goldberg about 1900G, so again, patients can have um, tissue or blood. Um, with tissue, it has to be any CLIA-approved uh, lab, whereas for blood, it can be foundation medicine or garden 360. Um, if tissue is available at the time of progression, that tissue would be submitted and would be um, analyzed in, by foundation. You'll hear in just a bit about S1900F, and this is for patients with RET fusion who've developed progression after frontline TKI. For this, it's a little bit different. We're just looking for proof of um, RET fusion positive result. Again, CLIA certified lab. And then patients can have tissue that is then submitted to lung mat for confirmatory testing. But patients can go on with just that initial proof initially. One piece that comes up often is whether or not we're still capturing PDL1 testing, and that was removed some time ago. So remember that PDL1 testing isn't performed as part of this study. Um, we capture PDL1 testing results for data analysis. And then again, when you hear from Dr. Cazono about some of the, um, the uh, correlative and biomarker work that we have, this is certainly important. And then in terms of eligibility, a lot has changed in these 10 years, particularly patients are receiving much longer courses of adjuvant therapy. So patients who've received adjuvant therapy are eligible at the time if they've had progression greater, or if the progression um, occurs greater than one year from the last day of that therapy. And those patients who are on um, immune checkpoint inhibition, so patients who've been treated with chemoradiation or receiving adjuvant atezolizumab, progression must occur within one year from the initiation of that therapy. So if it occurs on immune checkpoint inhibitors, patients that are, are then eligible for study without having necessarily to undergo um, platinum therapy again. For patients who are on adjuvant osimertinib, the progression has to occur while they're taking osimertinib. Um, not if they've been off and then relapse. 
one piece that's important is that um, there's always been a lot of discussion about whether um, we should really increase the eligibility or broaden the eligibility to, in, a, to include patients who are PS2. The feeling has been that because of uh, the, bio, the requirements about biomarker testing, because of um, some of these studies having, uh, having um, sort of toxicity windows, you heard about that with the capmatinib and osimertinib um, trial, just in terms of safety, it's important to keep it a little bit more restricted to uh, patients who have um, better performance status. Certainly in the confirmatory stage three trials, as Dr. Reckham mentioned, it makes much more sense to include a larger patient population. So those are some of the updates that we've been working on. Um, certainly, I think that this mirrors a lot of the work that has happened, again, going from a squamous trial to a panhistology trial, and now including patients who have received um, targeted therapies in the frontline setting and looking for mechanisms of resistance. So I'm happy to take any questions, um, if you have any. Thanks, uh, Jesse. Uh, any questions either online or in the room? We're going to post all these online someplace, right? Yeah. Oh, here comes the chat. Okay. Okay. You, you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this hybrid format takes some work here. Okay, what do we got there? They were asking about most common exclusionary meds, which I think probably goes back to the last um, talk. Um, do you have a, a high level? Do you have like a list? I think they're asking for a list. Yeah, I mean, the, the, oh, for 1900G. Yes, correct. Um, there's a reference in the protocol, but we can provide it. Yeah. Section seven of the protocol. Section seven of the protocol. And if you have any questions, you can email us or Laura. Okay, we better move on. We're running a little bit late. So now we have 1900 Fs. Now in the SWAG, the, the lung share also is the chair of a protocol, like a player coach here. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Gray is the chair of this, along with Yasser Elman as the co-chair, with our champion, David Gandera, and uh, who else but Mary as the lead statistician. So, 1900F, it's all yours. All right. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to keep up with Dr. Herbst and all his roles. All right. So, um, if I may take a little bit of liberty, because I think you guys have heard a lot about this study already, thanks to Dr. Patel, um, as well as to, to Dr. Goldberg for setting such a nice stage. I, I think... Um, I wanted to highlight for a moment Dr. Redcamps and, and Dr. Um, Dragness study with uh, Project Pragmatic. And really one of the things there that I want to drive home is this is a brand new platform, brand new approach. I think sometimes we get these studies and we focus on the drugs um, and we focus on the patient population, but it's really about rethinking how we do phase three registration clinical trials. And it is to keep it simple for us it is to keep it simple also for the investigators and simple for the patients to improve access and make sure that we get more representation from diverse patient populations on clinical trials. Those patients, all the patients sitting in our waiting rooms deserve access to clinical trials, not just some, not that the haves, not just the haves, but everybody. And so I just wanted to make sure that we highlighted that so just real quickly, I'll just spend a little time talking about this study that was just activated. It is looking at patients who've received prior RET uh, TKI. It could be any RET TKI because it, the benefit here that it's under the lung map umbrella protocol is that I do encourage you to talk to your pharmacist, talk to your providers about which patients they have on current RET inhibitors. And through the lung map protocol, you can start pre-screening those individuals even based on your local test results. And so whether you use, we saw in the chat, um, uh, we are messaging some individuals about the types of tests that are accepted, whether you use Tempest, whether you use Keras, Neogenomics, um, 
foundation, your in-house testing, if uh, liquid uh, or tissue testing, if you have a result with a RET fusion, send enroll those patients. When we've spoken with the Happy Lung Project, which is the patient advocacy group for, RET, for patients with RET mutations, they have told us this is what patients are looking for. This is the question they get asked. When I fail this therapy, what's next for me? So you can start lining up those patients. And I think that's really going to be a, a great approach um, and opportunity for, for those patients. Um, and I think as mentioned earlier, also if patients already have a foundation testing, you can upload those reports also, and you do not need to provide additional tissue specimens in those settings. With the other assays, you will, uh, you will need to do that. Uh, just to summarize here, it's, patients will be randomized to carboplatin and pemetrexid. Uh, plus or minus cell per catnip, and then they go on to maintenance therapy. Uh, so this really does focus on a non-squamous uh, patient population. And uh, in the interest of time, um, I'll be happy to take questions or chat with others at a different uh, different time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Janelle. Any burning questions? If not, anything in the chat there, uh, Karen? Okay, we'll move on. So next we have... Uh, uh, here's the uh, um, 1800D. So for this, we have Dr. Rangel, Dr. Hussein, and uh, Dr. Rangel, are you on the line? This is Swag calling Dr. Rangel. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Rangel, he he's been a trooper. This fellow, he's got a new baby. He um. He, he, he was with us all day yesterday. Why don't we skip this and we'll come back to Dr. Rangel if we, and I'll text him. Um, so now we'll go to uh, 1900E. Swag calling Dr. Pata. Dr. Pata, are you there? <laughs> I am on the line, Roy. Can you hear me? Yeah, so do, do, do you want to talk and I'll advance the slides for you or how do you want to do this? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Thank you. All right, so this is a brief update on S1900E, which is uh, looking at sotorasib in co-mutation subsets of KRAS gtopsy and lung cancer. So as Roy, as you said, uh, precision on top of precision is the kind of questions that LungMap can ask. So uh, we all saw sotorasib efficacy data come out uh, last year in 2021 from the Codebreak 100 study that resulted in its accelerated approval. Uh, objective response rate, 37%, duration of response, 11 months, progression-free survival, seven months, and median overall survival of just over a year. I am reminding you of these numbers because the Code Break 200 study was just presented at ASMO, and we'll look at those in comparison to these. As part of this initial study, they did look at commutation subsets and how that may impact efficacy of soda acid. Uh, looking at P53 and SDK11 mutations overall, it didn't seem to have an impact. P1 mutations were associated with inferior objective response rate, but maybe that's not the whole story. We know this is extremely heterogeneous disease, and some of these co-mutations can co-occur with one another. So when accounting for SDK11 mutations that are exclusive and P1 wild type, there may be some enhanced response rate better point estimates of PFS and OS. But of course, uh, this is an exploratory look back of this code break 100 expansion cohort and the biomarkers are not rigorously defined up front. Next slide, please. And so this is a code break 200 data that was presented at ESMO, a randomized phase three study of sotorasib versus uh, docetaxel. Of note, all of these patients had received both platinum chemo and immunotherapy. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and it was a positive study when looking at the primary endpoint uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.66. The medians are not that impressive, uh, 5.6 months for sotorasib versus 4.5 for docetaxel. However, if you follow out a little bit longer than 12 months, you can see uh, the curves start to separate a little bit more. However, across the point estimates, objective response rate fell into the high 20 range, uh, the median duration response into single digits at the eight and a half months. And then Roy, if you could hit the next button, please. Uh, oh, one more back. Yeah, so there was no difference in, in overall survival. Yes, there was crossover. It was only about 34% that crossed over from docetaxel to sotorasib. The hazard ratio was sitting right at one. Uh, and the median now it fell uh, below a year uh, uh, in overall survival. So I think um, 
more uh, modest activity than anticipated against uh, docetaxel. So next slide, please. So I think this, uh, this uh, the code break uh, 200 study randomized phase three data uh, actually uh, continues to promote the reason S1900E remains important uh, because there's a question is, do we need to be more selective in our use of these KRAS G12C inhibitors by accounting for uh, commutations and how they may interact with immunotherapy, how, how they may interact with these KRAS G12C inhibitors. And so S1900E has a big advantage because of the rigorous upfront uh, commutation definitions that are used for the P53, SDK11 uh, cohorts. And then there's an other cohort for any co-occurring commutations for KEEP1 mutations. And so we'll be able to get a sort of clean assessment of what's going on in terms of efficacy in these uh, defined subsets. And of course, the whole stats design, the 95% confidence intervals around the objective response rate uh, are, is designed to answer this uh, question. So hopefully this will uh, give us more information of how these commutations impact these inhibitors. Next slide, please. And so uh, I had made these slides a few weeks ago. I have the most updated numbers. We're about two thirds accrued. We've had uh, 75 out of 160 participants accrued, including uh, 33 in P53, 16 in STK11, and 26 in the catch-all other cohort. Uh, and this includes three in the last 30 days and one in the last week. I will say that the P53 and STK11 cohorts are meeting their accrual goals. Uh, so that is fantastic news. Um, kind of surprisingly, uh, the others are still meeting their accrual goals, but on the uh, more conservative end. So this is anybody who doesn't fit into the first two cohorts for biomarker eligibility can enroll into this other cohort. So I want to continue to emphasize it. A patient doesn't need to have a commutation in their tumor of a P53 or STK11 to go on the study. We have uh, the other cohort to allow them to enroll as well. And given the um, accelerated approval last year, given now the randomized phase three studies, we are always doing a reassessment of how we could make this trial easier for patients, easier for investigators. We did put forth amendment in April of this year that really tried to liberalize eligibility around washouts, allowing asymptomatic brain metastases. I actually asked for the accrual numbers being before and after this amendment, and unfortunately, after this amendment, our accrual numbers have gone down. I think that's probably not related to the uh, amendment, but I was hoping to kind of see the opposite. We're looking at the protocol again to see if we can further liberalize eligibility or um, make the schedule of events easier. Uh, we've worked with SWOG, uh, with Amanda Stamplis and Frank DeSanto and SWOG uh, Communications uh, to build a social media uh, toolkit and patient-friendly uh, language handouts that has been approved by the CSIRB, and I think the communication will go out uh, at the beginning of November to all uh, sites. Uh, so that's some additional uh, resources uh, for the different sites that are accruing. Um, Judy Johnson has been really uh, helpful in terms of thinking about other patient concerns as it relates to uh, the study and also some uh, publications that have been put out there about Sidoracid. And Jennifer Beeler, who's our protocol coordinator, is uh, getting um, input from our SWOG ops office and site coordinators committee meeting just to see if we can get everyone's ideas to make this as simple as possible because we think this question remains important. So thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, Suki. Um, <laughs> very timely study and um, uh, looking forward to it accruing more. Here are the contacts. Suki, uh, her co-chair uh, is David Gerber at Southwestern, and you can see the, the, the usual place to get questions answered. So um, we're, any sign, Dr., uh, who are we looking for? Rango. Dr. Rangel, uh, uh, are you there yet? Okay, we'll show the, the schema, let's show the schema. So this is, um, N803, ALT803, which is an IL-15 agonist it's trying to warm up the tumor microenvironment. And here's the schema. And um, it's you, there are two groups on this trial. There's either those who um, have primary resistance, PD in fewer than 12 weeks, or those who have 
acquired resistance PD in greater than 12 weeks, the same definition we've used for some of our other trials. You can see the, the, the acquired resistance group is looking for 300 patients and the primary group 130. Anyone here put anyone on this trial yet? Anyone online, raise your hand. So here's the accrual update as of October 16th, 43 total, um, seven in the last in the last 30 days and five to the primary resistance court. Mary, any comments? Some, some yeses on the line. Okay, good. And one in screening. But it's an important study and, and of course we want to know if there are um, reasons why sites are having challenges either opening it at their site or uh, recurring patients because it's a it's an important study for, for lung method as a whole and we want it to be successful. Great and Dr. Rangel is very engaged. Uh, we have the state police looking for him. Tune in at six for uh, an update. Okay. <laughs> If I can uh, just add, you know, we know that there's been some stability issues with the compound um, and we're working through that. We've been able to increase the stability um, from 15 minutes to four hours for part of it and we're working on the rest of it. So uh, hopefully that'll make things easier at your site. It's an exciting drug, you know, about half of lung tumors are cold. You know, you look at the till cells and you don't find them. So it doesn't matter how much PD-1, PD-L1, what combinations you put in there, if there are no T cells, Immunotherapy is not going to work. So we're excited about this trial, and uh, um, hopefully, now that we're fixing the formulation, you know, restrictions, it should be better. Yeah, but feel free to email us at the various emails that we've posted if you have um, input you'd like to give to us about that study or any of the other studies that we have ongoing. Here's the inputs right here. Okay, now, Dr. Kozno, are you there? I sure am. So, uh, okay. thank you. Uh, so, uh, do you want me to run the slides for you? You'll just I say next. Yeah, if you would, thank you so much. I'm so, uh, okay. yeah, okay. uh, yeah, really excited to give a couple updates about our translational medicine. Next slide, please. Um, and so, uh, you know, a best way to engage with us may be our teleconferences uh, that we run monthly. It's certainly a highlight of each month for me. Uh, we meet uh, every uh, third Tuesday of every month at these times here. Uh, just give a, a sense of what we've been discussing at these. Uh, for example, uh, we met with Foundation One to hear about an update to their tissue base set since that impacts um, you know, lung map on whole. Um, definitions for biomarkers, so you can really uh, hone these down precisely for studies like S1900F. Um, and then uh, a study looking at prevalence of code mutations that we're seeing in our screening studies uh, that we had earlier in the year. Uh, we're always eager to meet with the sub-study uh, groups, including uh, teams from 1900G and C, um, who we met earlier in the spring. But um, also, um, I think really um, taking a page from the idea of this being a public-private partnership, uh, we've invited uh, biotech and other companies to talk to us about their technologies, how we might be able to engage with them to uh, study them using our samples when they're sufficiently uh, well along their path of development. And these include some of the ones you see here, including GenPro and Nuclei. Um, they've been very productive meetings, I feel. Next slide, please. Uh, I really want to see great ideas come and uh, not, not for this to be hard uh, to get to us. So we devised this um, really one page um, inquiry really designed around understanding if we have within LungMap um, the resources that could help answer the questions uh, that you all have. And so um, I can get this to anybody who's interested. Uh, we have a general inbox here listed on this slide. Um, and uh, if you just kind of tell us what you're interested in and, and uh, the kind of samples you think you might need, uh, we could start thinking about whether it may be a good fit for lung map and really here to help any way we can. Next slide, please. I mean, uh, you know, in, in all fairness, there is a process that we follow to evaluate translational medicine. And, the, you know, there are several different role groups. I don't mean this to be um, you know, a daunting process, but rather uh, it's really meant to try to encourage success for ideas. So we want to make sure that our group um, has an opportunity to help uh, refine the science, that our ops folks can uh, make sure things can go smoothly, our, our you know, uh, statisticians can review, you know, the numbers and make sure that uh, you're likely to see a statistically significant result. Um, and so it really is all about just making sure that when we get a proposal in front of uh, CTEP, um, that, that it uh, really has a good shine to it. And, and so uh, this just lays it out, uh, but it's really our goal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, just as a general rule, the priority for use of biospecimens on NCI funded work uh, tends to be validation studies and hypothesis-based research, more so than exploratory analyses. 
And so it may be that um, ideas need to be vetted out a little bit, uh, not be purely exploratory to have high likelihood of you know, successfully accessing these samples. Uh, but nevertheless, we do have a second uh, tier of data, you know, genomic data that we have, digital pathology, things that you don't exhaust, in fact, and these can be much more widely um, shared. Um, given the lower risk that uh, we would exhaust these sa uh, precious samples. So please come with these ideas as well. And uh, we're always keeping an eye out for potential funding opportunities for getting uh, studies done. This one, for example, is, is really good for assay validation uh, that could be using lung map samples potentially uh, if you have a, a, you know, a, a test in mind. Next slide, please. Um, and then um, I think for the uh, sake of time, I'll skip this one. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, but this uh, one right before this, I, I, I really like this um, study that Jonathan and others have worked on uh, because I think it exemplifies why translational medicine means as much uh, to us that, you know, not every trial has the success of S1800A. It was wonderful that did, but we do have an opportunity to make every trial count. And this is how. So with this S1900A study, which was looking at a PARP inhibitor, um, uh, what we saw was that it didn't help enough patients to be considered a positive trial, but there could be a subset of patients who stood to benefit much more than the rest. And it really came down to uh, whether patients had a mono or biallelic mutation, one or two copies of alterations in these uh, BRCA genes. So this is different than what you might see in breast cancer. It really tells you about how lung cancer might be different and how it responds to treatments like this. And this is what uh, you could see using uh, tissue, but uh, with the importance of being able to follow changes over time and the relative ease of getting blood samples to do so, I, I envision this is going to be an increasingly important part of lung map, being able to do these liquid biopsy specimens and really looking to see how tumors may respond, uh, including with genetic changes upon you know, being treated with some therapy. And this is uh, going to be a project where we're going to be able to learn a lot that way, I feel. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Just try to keep the time. Oh, uh, this one here, um, just want to uh, give a sneak preview. So we have the sequencing data from the S1400 uh, series, uh, the, the first major screening platform for uh, lung map. Um, and uh, I, we've learned a good deal from uh, an analysis of these data and have a manuscript just about ready to submit at this point. Uh, I have a very nice story around, uh, a, you know, hitherto not too well-known gene PARP4 um, that I hope to talk about through this manuscript. Uh, but um, we're going to, in the process, put these data out so people can analyze and you know, see all the different ways one could interpret and make good use of these data because we, we did not certainly have every possible idea we could run through this. And we want the community to have that opportunity as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then uh, just uh, again to mention the importance of liquid biopsy analyses, uh, we have ongoing work really understanding the concordance between uh, the tissue uh, sequencing results and that of uh, the blood ctDNA. Um, this is going to be important because we like to increasingly be able to use blood test results to guide uh, sub-study enrollment. And we also are getting data, uh, you know, from a sub-study by sub-study basis uh, because most of the uh, uh, you know, current series of lung map trials have at least one and up to five time points of ctDNA collection um, that I think could be very informative. So stay tuned on all that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, just a shout out for a, a poster we'll see here uh, when Sitsi is in Boston in a couple of weeks. A very nice work by David Gandara looking at a composite immune checkpoint inhibitor signature um, that really uh, goes, uh, I think, a few steps further. Uh, from what we can do with things like tumor mutational burden and PDL1, um, you know, expression, uh, taking in additional important factors to really predict the benefit of the therapies. Uh, so stay, uh, stay tuned. It's a great poster that uh, uh, will be there uh, here in second week of November. Um, I think that's what I have. Um, upcoming priorities, uh, just to mention a few, uh, we are uh, hard at work on uh, amendments to several of the S1900 and 1800 studies, including the a very nice 1800A study, so we could really maximize what we learned from ctDNAs collected on those. And we want to find further ways to streamline TM research, uh, really to try to make it as accessible as possible for people. Okay, thank you very much. That was great. Any, uh, I, you know, tumor banks are good, but they're 
they work both ways. They bring in samples, but we want to use them. So we really are looking for ideas uh, from people, right, David? You, you know, we want to, we, and we, you know, if people want to write grants, they need a confirmatory set. You know, this, this this is one of the largest banks available, certainly in the squamous and now uh, non squamous as well. We're at time, and we have a lung committee coming up pretty soon. Um, for drug selection committee, Haas had to leave. Um, uh, you know, he, um, but um, um, what I would do now is I will introduce Saima Rocker, who's on, and, and Saima is going to be taking over as the new uh, chair of the Drug Selection Committee. Saima, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, so what we'll do is um, we'll finish by four so that there's time for a little bit of you know, stretching before the next meeting. Does that sound good? So if you could, in about five minutes, give us a little introduction, and we'd love to uh, hear your vision for the Drug Selection Committee. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Roy. Uh, can we advance the slide? So here are Haas's disclosures. Next slide. And here are mine. Next slide. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the Drug Selection Committee and its role and uh, where these ideas come up from. Uh, some of the studies that we have uh, opened uh, through LungMap, uh, these are investigator initiated. And this, the concept is um, uh, discussed in the Drug Selection Committee, and uh, then further with uh, pharmaceutical entities, and then a, a protocol is developed. In other circumstances, the pharmaceutical company has initiated the idea and approached us, and we have uh, discussed that uh, more formally in the, in the Drug Selection Committee as well. Uh, there's an initial qualification process, um, and in that, basically, we're looking at um, if there's an investigational drug, if there would be an appropriate biomarker that would be uh, used in conjunction with that. And for most of these studies, we require to have robust preclinical data, as well as some clinical data supporting the safety of the agent, as well as the potential for efficacy, especially when we're looking at a targeted therapy approach, or even when we're looking at a non-match approach, uh, combining different uh, uh, drugs um, and patients uh, who ha have immunotherapy refractory disease. Um, so usually we're looking at uh, agents that are ready to enter phase two uh, when we're looking into the uh, initiation of a study through the Drug Selection Committee. Um, the candidates for um, this are then evaluated candidate protocols through the official Drug Selection Committee. This is composed of key investigators and clinical researchers, also biomarker experts and molecular target experts from academia and CI and FDA, and well, as well as non-conflicted industry-based drug developers. Um, these um, possible candidate studies are then scored uh, based upon the target appropriateness for lung map, and then uh, the data from the biomarker preclinical and clinical data, as well as PK and PD data. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, the sub-study suggestions can come from various sources. Uh, after the initial uh, discussions, uh, there's an informal presentation from the uh, pharmaceutical company and investigator to the Internal Drug Selection Committee, then it goes to Full Drug Selection Committee, and uh, there's formal voting uh, with six criteria for evaluation. Each of these are scored on a one to nine scale. Um, these include the target appropriateness for non-small cell lung cancer, our understanding of the drug and biomarker, preclinical data, PKPD, toxicity and clinical data, and the PI has the final decision if the vote is uh, uh, close or if uh, any issues are brought up. Then we send the, invest the acceptance or deferral letters to pharma, and then we have kickoff calls and teleconferences with FNIH, SWAG operations, and uh, for uh, concept and protocol development, as well as we discuss the regulatory aspects and FDA requirements, confirmation of drug supply, and we complete the contract agreements. Next slide. Um, as we know, we have a main screening protocol and then a series of studies, which are the biomarker-driven studies with S1900 and then letters next to them, and then the non-match sub-studies. Next slide. Um, many of the studies have been discussed a little bit already today, but just uh, to summarize, we have uh, four different studies uh, in the targeted arena, which are under development. Uh, including S1900G of ozomertinib and capmatinib with, without ramucirumab. Uh, there is S1900I of an EGFR TKI plus or minus anti VEGF therapy for EGFR exon 20 insertion mutations. Uh, S1900J of an EGFR met by specific antibody uh, for high MET amplification. And S1900K of a MET TKI with or without anti VEGF therapy. Next slide. 
uh, in the non-match, um, we have two studies that have been uh, looked at. One is um, a study of anti pdl one plus docetaxel and anti-VEGF therapy versus standard of care. Uh, and the second is of uh, anti tiget plus anti-PD-1 and anti-VEGF TKI. Uh, we all have heard about Pragmatica, and uh, there have been some uh, accrual concerns that have been raised by CTEP, due to which uh, these studies are both uh, on hold at present, uh, and we're waiting to discuss further with CTEP regarding both. Um, so to summarize, uh, through these studies, we have a significant potential for benefiting our patients. Lung map provides a unique opportunity to explore drugs or combinations in patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, as well as for us to be able to look at um, agents in rare patient populations, studies which would be hard to complete ordinarily. And we have a lot of support from NCI, FDA, and as industry sponsors. Um, and we also have significant opportunity to collect biospecimens uh, for correlative studies. You heard from uh, uh, David Kozono prior to me as well regarding this. And there's the opportunity for participation of all thoracic oncologists, translational scientists, and other interested parties across the country. Thank you. Uh, thanks. That, that was wonderful. So um, bring your ideas, those who are with pharma here. We want your best agents. We want the best targets. We have a process. The process works well. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, your committee, Simon, most important because you've got to keep the, the stock coming. We've got to keep having new innovative ideas. So uh, we're all looking forward to working with you. Well, listen, we're at 4 o'clock. I've even lost some of my chairs up here. Because <laughs> there, there are other meetings going on. The Lung Committee at 415. Can you tell us the room, please, Mary? Um, I think it's Regency A or something, or B, or C. Thank so, you. So it's downstairs. I, with, I didn't know a letter, but I knew the, the names. They <laughs> so you have 14 minutes um, to get ready. Um, Haas, um, you know, uh, had to head, head to the airport because it's Friday afternoon. Um, but um, I'll just thank you. Thank you, Mary, for sticking with me here till the end. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to everyone on the line. Um, virtual attendings, you can see, we'll, we'll leave the computer on so you can put some questions in. We got the ops team here. Well, and, uh, actually, email us questions. Email or, us. Yeah, because those will get lost online. Okay, come to the lung committee, then there's a nice reception tonight. Um, all good. Okay, bye.